Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Good afternoon on this really rainy, cold, rainy day. So thank you so much for coming out and filling the room. It's great to see such a response. I'm Adam Lupel, IPI Vice President, and it is my distinct honor to welcome you to today's Global Leaders Series event, a conversation with His Excellency Marcel Amontano, Minister of Foreign Affairs of the Republic of Cote d'Ivoire. Minister, welcome to IPI. We are also uh, honored to be joined for today's discussion by Jean-Pierre Lacroix, United Nations Undersecretary General for Peace Operations. Welcome back to IPI. Uh, you will truly need no introduction in this room, I am sure. The Global Leader Series event at IPI seeks to foster a dynamic and constructive exchange of views between our speakers and international policymakers on a range of peace, security, development, and humanitarian issues. Over the past two years, the Global Leader Series has hosted representatives from Estonia, Liberia, Sweden, and Yemen. Today, um, Minister Tano began his career as a government official as Minister of Transport then served as Minister of Tourism and Minister of Construction, Urban Planning and Housing. Between 2010 and 2012, he served as the Director of the Cabinet of the President of the Republic. He later served as a Minister Cabinet Director of the President of the Republic between 2012 and 2016, before his appointment as Foreign Minister in January 2017. We are particularly pleased to have the opportunity to speak with the foreign minister as his country concludes its two-year term as an elected member on the UN Security Council. This is Cote d'Ivoire's third term as an elected member, having previously served on the council from 1964-65 and from 1990-91. to Questions regarding how elected members can help to shape the agenda and outcomes of the Council, how the, they overcome the challenges inherent to a limited two-year term, and how they can best contribute to improving the long-term effectiveness and legitimacy of the Council are all questions of utmost importance to all member states today. Thus, we look forward to hearing the Foreign Minister's reflections about his country's term on the Security Council during this important but challenging period in the body's history. We are all aware of the situations where the members of the Council continue to navigate deep divisions, including on Syria, Yemen, Libya, and North Korea. But it is also important to reflect on the many areas of cooperation and progress that continue under the Council's mandate, especially as it is elected members who play very important roles in building consensus and identifying opportunities for progress. <coughs> Cote d'Ivoire's single Council presidency, which took place one year ago this month, highlighted some of these dynamics. It hosted formal debates on post-conflict reconstruction and peace, security, and stability, and on cooperation between the UN and regional and sub-regional organizations, which reflected on critical thematic issues on the Council's agenda. It also convened timely discussions on the missions in Guinea-Bissau, the Central African Republic, Haiti, and the Golan Heights. Uh, the minister will speak for about 15 minutes. Afterwards, we will have a discussion among our distinguished guests on the stage, and then I will open the floor for a question and answer session uh, with the audience. I, I should have mentioned at the start, the minister will speak in French, and on your headlets, headsets we have, uh, English is channel one and French, oh, oh, English is channel two, sorry, thank you. I guess that was what you were passing me the note for. <laughs> English is channel two and French is channel one. Um, so again, minister, welcome to IPI, the floor is yours. Mr. President of the IPI Institute, Excellence, Mr. Secretary General, Adrian of the Paix, 
Mr. Jean-Pierre Lacroix, dear friend, uh, excellence, uh, ambassadors, uh, dear uh, guests, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends from the press. I would like at the beginning of my uh, the talk to thank the API to have uh, organized this high-level panel with the permanent mission of uh, Côte d'Ivoire, uh, offering us the opportunity to share with you the overall uh, outcomes of the mandate of the Côte d'Ivoire as a member of the Security Council, as well as its pro priorities starting 2020 at the end of its mandate. The collaboration between Côte d'Ivoire and the IPI had already allowed us to organize in April 2017, if you remember, within the framework of a campaign for a seat of a non-permanent member, etc., on the uh, after the we managed our crisis, as well as the priorities of uh, peacekeeping and national se international security. To better appreciate the outcomes of Côte d'Ivoire, it's important to remember the constants that are at the base of its foreign policy, as well as the priorities uh, that, along with synergy, have guided its action in the two years of activities within the Security Council. Uh, from a political point of view, the attachment of the Côte d'Ivoire to dialogue as a privileged way to prevent and solve conflicts, as well as to multilateralism as an ideal framework to elaborate consensual solutions to the contemporary uh, challenges, constitute the principles that guide the action of my country on the international diplomatic stage. Concerning the priorities of my country, the Security Council, they have been in uh, perfect coherence with the useful role that it wanted to uh, take and that come from its own uh, recent experience. So share uh, experience in uh, crisis resolution and peace consolidation. Contribute to uh, peace strengthening and international security, including through activities of uh, of peacekeeping of the United Nations, amplify the voice of the African Union on security and humanitarian uh, issues that, uh, are, that marginalize the development of the country. Mr. President, Mr. Vice President, the outcome of Cote d'Ivoire will be appreciated in terms of its participation to searching uh, national, regional, and transversal uh, resolution to the agenda of the Security Council, resolutions of presidential declarations it contributed to, as well as its uh, actions that had to do uh, with, as a pen holder in the situation of Guinea-Bissau and its support to the uh, UNOWAS. This outcome can also be judged through its precedence in the working group on the operations of peacekeeping and that of uh, the sanction committees concerning the Central African Republic. So on uh, issues relative to peace, security, and stability in Africa, Cote d'Ivoire constantly worked within the platform of the framework of the African countries, members of the Security Council, the A3, of uh, taking into consideration the recommendations of the Peace Council of Security of the African Union in the resolutions, PRST, and other uh, positions taken by the Council. Concerning this, whether it be the conflict in Libya, security situ and humanitarian situations in the basin of Lake Chad and in Sahel, as well as uh, issues relative to the Central African Republic, South Sudan, Darfur, Somalia, Burundi, or the Horn of Africa, my country has always insisted on the necessity of uh, reinforced cooperation between the United Nations and the African Union concerning peace and security in accordance with the strategic framework for prevention of conflicts signed on April between the two institutions on April 19, 2017. It brings an active support respectively to the regional bureaus of the United Nations in Africa, in West Africa and Sahel, UNOWAS, and Central Africa, UNOCA, insisting on the mediation roles essential to the prevention of conflicts. Concerning uh, issues of uh, peace, security, and stability in Asia and the Middle, w Middle East, the Cote d'Ivoire has given a particular interest to the uh, Israel-Palestinian crisis, the conflict in Syria and Afghanistan, as well as the situation of Rohingyas in, in uh, Myanmar, where 
for uh, which, which always recommend dialogue as uh, a solution. It was also was also constant in its appeal uh, to uh, Israel-Palestinian dialogue as well as the solution of two uh, states coexisting peacefully in the frontiers of before 1967, both having Jerusalem as a capital. Concerning Syria and Yemen, my country always insisted on political processes to of uh, crisis resolution and uh, crisis management uh, uh, of the humanitarian situation in those countries. Insisted on the necessity of uh, lasting uh, ceasefire in these uh, areas of tension in order to often to open uh, essential uh, political spaces for the installation of constructive dialogue between the stakeholders. Concerning the uh, Popular Republic of Korea and Iran concerning nuclear arms and ballistic missiles, Cote d'Ivoire always insisted on the installation of uh, fertile dialogue as the best way in order to find mutually acceptable solutions and the preservation of peace and international and regional security. Affirming its support to the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action concerning uh, uh, the Iranian nuclear question and diplomatic efforts concerning North Korea, Cote d'Ivoire always affirmed its opposition to all military, any military solution, convinced that it would be counterproductive and would only exacerbate regional and international tensions. Concerning transversal issues, my country always supported all the initiatives in view of reinforcing peace consolidation of in the, by the United Nations, especially the Action for Peace Initiative, a for p of Secretary General of the United Nations, Mr. Antonio Guterres. Along with the Netherlands, my country also was at the origin of the creation of the support group to the initiative A4P and co-presided, along with Egypt, the group of uh, friends of the DDR. It also supported the initiatives and uh, Security Council resolutions concerning the role of women uh, concerning peace and security, as well as the protection of uh, civilians and children in periods of conflict. Mr. Vice President, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Secretary General, at this uh, point, I would like to remind some resolutions, presidential declarations, and pre uh, press statements that Cote d'Ivoire contributed to have adopted. So these are the followings. Resolution 2458 of 2019, of February 28, 2019, on the renewal of the mandate of the Integrated Bureau of the UN for the Consolidation of Peace in Guinea-Bissau. There's also resolution 2417, 2018, that condemns without ambiguity the use of hunger as a, as a weapon of war and ask for humanitarian access in all security and uh, in a timely manner for civilians needing uh, needing food, nutritional, or medical aid. Resolution 2447, 2008, on the contribution of operation of peacekeeping of the UN. Uh, capacity building of the host countries uh, for a police, judicial, and penitentiary bodies. Two PRSTs expressing the support of the Conseil of Union 1 and calling uh, for uh, good mediations in South Africa and an effective contribution of the renewal of the mandate of MINUSMA, uh, keeping the actual number of troops in terms of the renewal of mandates of MINUSCA and FISNUA. And finally, two press statements concerning the political situation in Guinea-Bissau. President of the Working Group on the um, Peace Maintenance Organizations, we've garnered together nine experts, nine meetings with experts concerning the improvement of the efficiency of peacekeeping. It has also headed the Committee on Sanctions against the uh, Central African Republic to lighten the arms embargo, arm, in, arm embargo in order to uh, favor the strengthening of the capacities of the Central Ar African Army. Finally, it should be noted that the presidency of the 
Ivory Coast and the Security Council in December 2018, bearing on its in, in will to preserve the unity of the Council on questions relating to peace and international security, uh, was uh, marked by two high-level debates. One which was uh, leaded by the Presidency of the Republic of Ivory Coast, His Excellency, President of Ivory Coast, His Excellency, Mr. Elassine Ouattara, on 5th of December. The other was headed by me on the 6th of December, 2018, devoted to the need to collaborate between sub-regional, regional, and organizations in the UN system in peacekeeping operations. 22 public meetings were also organized during this presidency which um, oversaw the adoption of five resolutions, three presidential declarations, and eight declaration statements of the process. Mr. The President, Mr. Assistant Secretary General, during his two-year mandate, its two-year mandate, the Ivory Coast is proud to have modestly contributed to uh, peacekeeping and international s security. As a non-permanent member of the Security Council, its voice has been heard, a voice in the service of dialogue, peace, and brotherhood between nations, the voice of a country in that has uh, taken its uh, peacekeeping uh, uh, responsibilities and has helped other countries in their crises to find the road to peace. The Ivory Coast has renewed its uh, contract with peace and stability, and today the Ivory Coast is one of the countries that contribute troops participating in peacekeeping operations and international security operations on behalf of the United Nations. In the words of the father of the Ivory Coast, Félix Efriot de Boigny, friend of everyone and an enemy of no one, the Ivory Coast intends to continue and even strengthen its commitment to peace, to security, and to meeting the sustainable development goals by an Act, by its active presence within the um, Peace Building Commission and the uh, Human Rights Council and Economic and Social Rights Council of the UN. My country aims to propose its candidacy for these two offices for the 2021-2023 mandates. Thank you very much for your support. Merci uh, beaucoup. Um. Comprehensive review of Cote d'Ivoire's time on the Council, and uh, when you hear it laid out like that, it is clearly a, uh, an extraordinarily productive time. Uh, IPI has been doing some thinking recently around how the elected members have an impact on the Council, how, as you say, they make their voice heard, and I think the experience of Cote d'Ivoire will, one that, we, it will be, uh, one that we could learn from uh, for many years to come. We're joined here uh, today by the Under Secretary General for Peace Operations. So, if you don't mind, I'd like to maybe focus for a moment on, on issues related to peacekeeping and the experience of, of uh, Cote d'Ivoire uh, for a couple questions, and then we can uh, open it up to the floor. Um, in, in just a few years, Cote d'Ivoire moved from being a country on the Security Council agenda that hosted a peacekeeping mission to being an elected member, actively participating in council decision-making on peacekeeping and many, many other things. And so I thought maybe we could start, um, Jean-Pierre, with you. Could you give us some of your reflections how you see Cote d'Ivoire's uh, presence on the council uh, contributed to decision-making on peacekeeping missions uh, in Africa, um, given their experience? Uh, with peacekeeping as, as a host country. Well, thank you very much and uh, good afternoon. Je vais peut-être uh, commencer en, en français. I'm maybe going to uh, start in uh, English, uh, thanks to the presence of uh, Mr. Uh, His Excellency Minister Marcel Amontano and uh, other colleagues who are here present. To begin with, I think that it's uh, v very meaningful and uh, quite uh, uh, quite impressive to see the Ivory Coast having gone from, as you have said, uh, uh, Your Excellency, from being a country 
whose uh, status uh, was as an item on the agenda, uh, in, uh, an agenda of the peacekeeping operations, to be an active contributor to the Conser Security Council's work in that uh, area. I think it has enriched the Security Council and it has enriched our actions to have the contribution of the Ivory Coast and more generally the, it's, uh, uh, the contribution of other countries who have directly experienced all the complexities and uh, as well as uh, the uh, added uh, value, the outcomes in uh, peacekeeping. A very active uh, contribution to the, to the Security Council. Um, and I think, um, I, I probably, I, I suspect that uh, uh, you know see having been one of the uh, early comprehensive multi-dimensional mission with so many different tasks, so many different responsibilities, and also having gone through so many different situation in the country, um, uh, including very uh, tense moments, uh, ranging from uh, the early stages where the, there was really a, a very traditional mission of uh, uh, ceasefire monitoring all the way to uh, the proactive use of robust force uh, and including supporting to uh, DDR, uh, the supporting uh, of uh, the support to organization of election, even going all the way to certifying the results of election, which was unprecedented and I think still remains unprecedented. So just by way of saying this has uh, probably given you a unique experience when it comes to peacekeeping. And I think that translated into the way in which uh, your country uh, took part and participated in the works of the Security Council and you highlighted many of these aspects so I don't want to sort of uh, 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 go through them again. Uh, I think uh, uh, the fact that Côte d'Ivoire has been a co-pen holder for uh, some of the issues and the agenda of the Security Council is very relevant because I do believe that we need that kind of involvement from uh, African uh, uh, members of the Security Council, the, your role on the supporting uh, uh, UNOWAS, uh, the role uh, that you, you had also uh, when it comes to uh, the, uh, the crisis in Guinea-Bissau and your very active uh, uh, engagement, but also uh, the critical role that you play in supporting the Action for a Peacekeeping Initiative since its inception. And there, uh, again, your experience and knowledge of peacekeeping has been absolutely vital. Uh, Action for Peacekeeping was born initially in the Security Council, or rather the, the, the emergence of Action for Peacekeeping started in the Security Council through the uh, very active support that your country and the Netherlands uh, provided to uh, this initiative. And, and throughout uh, the, the last month, uh, we've seen your country very active, not only in the working group, which has a critical contribution to our work on the cross-cutting issues related to peacekeeping, but also in taking action for peacekeeping forward. And I just want to end by saying uh, your uh, current contribution to uh, uh, peace operation on the ground and uh, the additional deployment of uh, uh, a battalion from Côte d'Ivoire also is, uh, is a reflection of your strong engagement. Right. Thank you. Minister, sort of jumping off that, what, could you share with us what, what lessons did your government bring to the Council um, out of the experience of having hosted UNOSI? And, and do you see that being applicable to, uh, to other countries in the midst of, uh, of transitions to, uh, from conflict to uh, peace and stability? Oui, merci beaucoup. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, what uh, I can tell you is that the lessons we've drawn from our experience in NOC and Ivory Coast is that you need the political will to cooperate, to collaborate with cooperation between the government uh, 
elect and the UN through UNOC. This is what we have attempted to do. Uh, and as I, I, I am accustomed to say, to be the good student, the, uh, the good uh, student, student of post-conflict countries by uh, submitting to the Security Council and the UN system following the agenda concerning the best way out of uh, the uh, crisis, the conflict. And in terms of uh, growing out of a crisis, you also have to adhere to the DDR, the uh, SSS, with in view of improving the lives of our citizens, because if the citizens aren't implied in the process, the process will be condemned to fail. So the main lesson to draw from what is uh, called the, the, the success story of the UN, which is the Ivory Coast, is, is precisely uh, this. Often we just focus on the DDR. We tell ourselves that you need to demobilize uh, the army, uh, former ex-combatants, but if that's the only thing you focus on, the citizens might not see any difference between the armed crisis and the post-conflict situation and no immediate improvement in their living conditions uh, concerning very essential needs. This it will be very difficult, difficult, and that's what the president has understood. So we've led uh, this uh, effort on two fronts. We financed uh, uh, 80 percent, uh, 72 percent, we financed our DDR process, and this makes it possible to rhythm the DDR in uh, terms of what you're able to do. For example, the president says you, we need a DDR within three years. Well, if you need, want a DDR within three years, and then you wait for the contribution from the international community to finance the DDR, then you're going to depend on that financing cadence, which is going to determine the amount of time it's going to take you to uh, come out of the crisis. So the success of the Ivory Coast is based on its own financing of the DDR and RSS. Uh, you have to remember that there are two, uh, uh, two armies in the field, so it's a very, the stakes are high uh, uh, to negotiate between these two uh, armies. So what we've tried to share with the other uh, uh, countries, post-conflict countries in the region, is that it is uh, possible to apply it everywhere, not even uh, limiting oneself to Africa. So the DDR, which is the one process to leave crisis, and the RSS, you have to keep an eye on improving the lot of the common people. Uh, thank you. You, you mentioned uh, the importance the lesson of the, the importance of political will, having uh, uh, a cons consensus on the best way forward, the need to improve the conditions um, for the people. Um, the, the drawdown, the closure of UN missions are inherently <coughs> political processes, complex political and operational processes. Um, and that leads me to one more question on peacekeeping. Um, Peacekeeping is, is largely observed to be in a moment of transition. IPI is actually doing uh, a fair amount of work. It's not just Cote d'Ivoire, but uh, uh, ex recent experiences in, in Liberia, uh, Haiti, uh, Darfur. Um, I wonder if I could ask you, uh, Mr. Undersecretary General, what, what, um, what lessons do you take away from the transition, specifically the transition in UNOSI, um, and how should these be apply to a future transition context. Merci. Je, je pense que Thank you. I think that all the missions of peacekeeping need to be considered as being or as being always in transition. That means that the transition doesn't arrive at the moment when we uh, thinking about the end of the mission because for for two main reasons. First because it's a uh, transition is something that is uh, prepared it's it's not something that you uh, put together uh, in the last few last year but uh, more deeply for the reason the minister indicated uh, peacekeeping if 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 it's going to be successful 
it's going to be successful within an integral framework. That means having, uh, along with it, actions, partners that work in order to Im improve the everyday uh, life of the populations. Uh, humanitarian actions, development actions, they need to be uh, go along with what our missions do on the ground with the political efforts uh, and, and, and along with the uh, uh, capacity building. As the missions advance in the implementation of their mandate, priorities evolve. And uh, we need to, that, that's what we do more and more with uh, independent evaluations that are done regularly uh, by the, cons the Security Council uh, really wants to uh, to see this uh, mandate very deeply. Uh, as the missions apply the, their mandate and that the situation evolves on the ground, priorities evolve as well. And if priorities evolve, it means that the partners' roles, uh, the, the development partners, also needs to evolve because what peacekeeping does not do, the others need to do. And all this brings us to transition. So that's the preparation of the transition. And the other thing I wish to say is that uh, that I detect uh, uh, from the Security Council, uh, which I think makes a lot of sense, to um, consider that uh, uh, the end of a peacekeeping operation in the sense of uh, an operation with the substantive military or uniform component uh, should not be the end of uh, any uh, political presence of the UN. And uh, this is why uh, the follow-on presence has been uh, uh, put in place in Haiti with the role of uh, the good offices, but also continuing the efforts on the support to uh, national uh, capacities, particularly in the areas of rule of law and police. And this is why we're currently working with uh, our partners within the system, but also with the African Union and very much the government of Sudan to determine what could be a follow-on presence after the uh, withdrawal of UNAMID. And I think there is already a consensus that uh, there has to be a follow-on presence. Indeed, the Security Council has mandated both us as well uh, as the uh, Peace and Security Council of the African Union mandated the African Union to work together to prepare what could be that follow-on presence. Great, thank you. It's a, it's a, a good segue to, um, to maybe ask you a question about uh, the African Union, uh, Minister. You mentioned in your, uh, in your remarks that you saw Cote d'Ivoire's presence on the Council as an opportunity to amplify the voice of the African Union. And I wonder if you could say a bit more about that. I mean, the, the, the partnership between the UN and the AU is increasingly important. That's recognized by, by all. Could you tell us what, what, um, what have been some of your most important experiences as one of the African three members on the Security Council? And, on which situations did you see the UN-AU partnership um, working very well, and, and where do you, would you like to see it strengthened? Merci, merci beaucoup. Thank you very much. First of all, uh, we shouldn't forget that as an African country, we're, uh, we are very happy to be part of the Security Council. The Côte d'Ivoire represents the West Africa, and the other countries represent uh, the precise areas of Africa. So the A3, that's how we're, we're called at the, in the Security Council, uh, plays a very important role, but that role is efficient if there's a good collaboration, a good synergy between the A3 
and the uh, Peace and Security Council of the African Union. That council uh, meets on particular councils on peace and security, uh, takes decisions, and those decisions are taken to the three countries, the three African countries, permanent members of non-permanent members of the uh, Security Council, and those three countries defend the uh, those decisions taken in the African Union Council at the Security Council. So often, very often, the, what's at stake is what's at stake is is to manage that the A3 talks in one voice. Union makes force, and the Cote d'Ivoire has given itself this role to make sure that the differences on uh, questions that are ascribed to the uh, Security Council are treated internally uh, at, at home, uh, in the home of the A3 by the members. And that then we always come to the Security Council as much as possible with a common position. And I think that during the two years of our mandate, we managed, uh, we managed this challenge and to make sure that the voice of Africa, uh, that there be only, only one voice for Africa at the Security Council that gave us uh, credibility, that gave us uh, some weight, and it gave us uh, a sense of our responsibilities. We saw the difference between uh, an a uh, divided A3 difference and an a united A3. So that's what I wish to say concerning that. The pen holder on Guinea-Bissau and Anolis, was that an additional challenge in this respect or was it uh, facilitated by this process of coming together at the a as the A3? It was a, an examination <laughs> that allowed us to verify that it was important to be united. Guinea Bissau, what, what we did on this is we, we, we took to the security res, uh, a resolution of, the, of ECOWAS. ECOWAS uh, took a decision uh, on sanctions, uh, civil sanctions sanctions on uh, particular uh, people. And we wish that in order to amplify those uh, ECOWAS sanctions, the Security Council uh, approves those uh, sanctions. It was not easy. Uh, no, 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 not everybody understood the interest of those targeted sanctions. But in the end, uh, we managed. F first, we, we, uh, we, we, we agreed within the A3, and then we managed to pass this resolution in the Security Council. Merci. A, a lot of a lot of material there, a lot on the table. I think we, uh, I, I, I still have a few other questions, but I think I'm being greedy, uh, and I think we should open it up to the to the floor to allow people to to uh, others to participate. So we have uh, about 30 minutes for for Q and A, and I, we welcome. Uh, please raise your hand, um, and if you don't mind, uh, uh, please introduce yourself, your, your name, and affiliation uh, for the for the webcast. The floor is open. Any questions? No questions. I can keep going. Oh, okay. Yes, here, one here, please. We can take a couple at a time if there's others. Thank you. Uh, my name is Manik Beta. I'm a syndicate journalist. Uh, my question relates to the Security Council. Do you see the possibility of any reforms? because we have been trying for, for a very long time without any success. Thank you. Question on the Security Council reform. Any, any others want to? Yes, sir, here in the front, in the second row, yeah. I thank you, Mr. Minister. I also thank, thank Mr. Lacroix for his presentation and API for the organization of this meeting. I am the rep permanent representative of Morocco. I wish to congratulate Mr. Minister and to thank you for his presence among us and his participation to this meeting today. Uh, this shows the interest and the importance that Cote d'Ivoire has given to its membership of the Security Council for the during the two years. Morocco was there. We followed the remarkable job that was done by the Cote d'Ivoire of uh, a friend, a friendly uh, 
broader country. So you talked about a modest contribution, Mr. Minister. I don't think your contribution was uh, modest. I think it was a huge contribution that Cote d'Ivoire brought to the work of the Security Council. And I wish to, we wish to pay tribute to your participation during those two years. You had uh, very important responsibilities. You talked about your presidency. Uh, you, you talked about the committee of the RCP and the work on the peacekeeping at a crucial moment of the reform of the peace and security that was uh, introduced by the Secretary General of the United Nations. Uh, so Morocco supported that contribution, but we think that your presidency in the working group on operations of peacekeeping allowed within the Security Council to bring all the necessary support to uh, keep uh, to, to international peacekeeping to that reform, and we thank you for it. We were also president of the sanction committee on the uh, uh, Morocco. Uh, was present with the configuration of peace and, the, and contributed largely to the MINUSCA. So we saw the work you did, and that allowed to uh, progress enormously towards dialogue and conciliation in the uh, Central African Republic. I don't have questions, but I just wanted to uh, take the floor uh, to pay tribute to all the work that was done by the Cote d'Ivoire as representative of Africa. You brought the voice of Africa within the Security Council, and you represented all the interests and positions of Africa within this organ. Uh, you worked for the strengthening of cooperation uh, in the United, between the United Nations and the African Union. You did a great job. I also wish to come back to the uh, story. Uh, you are a real success story because you uh, you went from a country that uh, uh, was on the agenda of, uh, of the Security Council, and now you are a country that has contributed troops. So this is thanks to the will of uh, of the Cote d'Ivoire and His Excellency President Watawara that has uh, is putting uh, Cote d'Ivoire on the trajectory of, of progress and success. And uh, this has been very important for uh, social uh, and uh, development. And so I wanted to, uh, you also incarnate transparency at the Security Council. Uh, after the message of come and say, I, the, after the presidents, you, you, your presidents, uh, in Morocco in 2012, we had a presidency in December. It was a short presidency. Uh, the presidency of Mr. President, your presence was uh, also shows all the importance that you give to the council. And I thank you very much for this opportunity. And I wish you um, uh, a lot of uh, success, inshallah, uh, within the Council of Human Rights. And you can count on the support of Morocco. Uh, Uh, Dr. Marcel Amirgo. Uh, Dr. Marcel Amirgo, a consultant of, uh, of uh, international diplomacy of the, of the OCD. I'm also responsible for uh, civil security in Burkina Faso. I, I'm going to uh, take this opportunity to thank Cote d'Ivoire, in particular uh, President Alassane Ouattara, for having contributed since 2014 uh, to uh, avoid uh, civil war in Burkina Faso. So my question uh, is... Uh, so, uh, mm, my question, given that the Ivory Coast has entered the security se secure, security council and the different ways Ivory Coast works in, in peacekeeping, uh, and given the crisis in Burkina Faso, I wanted to see how uh, Côte d'Ivoire could contribute to uh, solving, helping us resolve our problems. And as an African responsible for civil justice, I really wanted to ask a question. We in uh, s civil society realize that uh, a lot depends on an individual, an individual who goes for peace or for violence. And uh, after the elections of 2020, things uh, were fearing violence. Uh, and uh, so we want to see how the Ivory Coast can help promote peace in our context, in the subregion. Thank you. Uh, the first uh, question concerned is reform. Um, I think that everybody will agree, along with our countries, 
that the, the Security Council, such as it exists today, does not uh, uh, reflect the world we actually live in. It's an anachronism. The question of reform, as I was telling my colleagues yesterday in the evening, uh, has to be d d is being discussed in the Security Council, not in the General Assembly. So the Ivory Coast, as a member of the UN, will try to make sure that the debate in the General Assembly, which has become, uh, which has lost energy, can once again regain a uh, dynamic uh, quality so that the debate uh, that existed at the time of Kofi Annan can ad continue advancing so that uh, the resolutions in the General Assembly are taken and then are carried to the Security Council both to be debated and decided on. So as things are, I would say that uh, the faster the better, because Africa will not continue to accept, given its weight in the world today, that it has no seat, no permanent seat in the Security Council, with everything that it entails as an advantage to have such a seat. The second question, it's not a question, it was a comment by my uh, brother from Morocco and uh, Ivory Coast and Morocco have excellent uh, relationship in terms of development and cooperation. I would like to thank you for your statement and you are right to say that uh, to go in transition from a conflict uh, country to a post-conflict country entering the Security Council while it is still with, well, it still has a post-conflict country, which has just uh, seen off a UN peacekeeping operation, and uh, whose mandate, as you uh, described it, uh, as exceptional within the Security Council. I think all of this means that it should encourage people in the same situation as us to um, match what we have done. It, uh, knowing that it is possible, that it wasn't an exception, and it is not an unattainable objective. And the Ivory Coast would like to extend itself, share its experience, because that is in the interest of the entire con continent. There will be no emerging of any country without the continent emerging. So the Ivory Coast must be generous in sharing its experience with all the countries who are going through conflict, have gone through conflict, and have a post-conflict status. And I hope that uh, Morocco will continue assisting us with ECOWAS. Uh, you, uh, the other uh, question, you have asked how Ivory uh, Coast will contribute to the situation in Burkina Faso. As you know, we just went through experience of terrorist attack in 2017 in Grand Bassin. Uh, and we, our countries, share a border, uh, our north, the northern border of our country. And uh, Mali shares uh, a border with Ivory Coast. So we are very preoccupied with what's going on in Mali as well as in Burkina Faso. The border countries have uh, been very preoccupied with the situation in the Sahel. So even though Ivory Coast does not belong to the G5 Sahel, President Ouattara has always made a pilgrimage to these other issues to attract the attention of the international community to finance the G5 Sahel initiative and has also attracted attention to the making the conditions likely in our country, the conditions in our country to prevent young people from joining uh, jihad. Uh, we have information sharing, intelligence sharing with Burkina, and in terms of ECOAS, uh, an important conference of ECOAS uh, dealt primarily with the in for situation in Sahel, uh, it took place in Ouagadougou. And uh, at the, as the outcome of that conference, West Africa decided to uh, uh, to put its mouth where its uh, money was. And 
we look at, of course, uh, and uh, so we decided to contribute to the G5 uh, Sahel, uh, and so in terms of cooperation, ECOWAS cooperation, it shows that all countries are concerned with the issue of terrorism. You know, as I say, uh, terrorism is an international issue, even countries that are very far from the fields of operation of the jihadists uh, can be caught up in terrorism at any given moment. And that is something we have seen on many occasions. D'autres questions de la salle? Uh, to, to, so, uh, 2020, I uh, don't want to uh, skew the question of 2020. I think 2020 it will go very well. Uh, for the following reason. And I'm not going to get sidetracked uh, by issues of uh, whether President uh, Ouattara is going to present himself, his candidacy once again. As you know, in all countries, what ensures stability is the will of the people to accede to that stability. That's the first thing. Secondly, after what Ivory Coast went through and what we are still discussing today, uh, I don't think that the politicians of the Ivory Coast wish to be held responsible for a, an unstable Ivory Coast. And I think that when the time comes, uh, w the different parties will enter into a dialogue, will make sure that happens to avoid w what happened to Ivory Co Coast before. Coming out of a crisis is expensive, and it is best to continue sustainable development than to let it slide. You all, you know that in Ivory Coast we also have many young people, 70% of the population, and the youth will not let us, the politicians, uh, risk the common heritage of Ivory Coast. Here. Uh, merci, Monsieur le Ministre, pour votre présence ici aujourd'hui et pour votre discours très intéressant. Je m'appelle John, je travaille à la mission permanente d'Irlande auprès des Nations Unies. Et uh, comme vous le savez peut-être déjà. And, uh, as you, you know, Ireland is a candidate for the non permanent seat on the Security Council for the 2021-2022 period. I would like to know what were the challenges to you as a non-permanent member of the Council? Or was being a non-permanent member, in fact, uh, an asset? Do you, did you have advantages uh, from that particular position? Uh, bonsoir, Monsieur le Ministre. Uh, hello. Uh, your Excellency, my name is Lucien Kouassi. I'm from Ivory Coast. I'm a teacher. Uh, you, you talked about the fact that the Security Council does not really represent the situation today. It's not representative. So what would the ideal situation be? Are there other uh, candidacies in the African uh, union who could be uh, non-permanent members of the Security Council. Do you have any suggestions? Very good. Um, maybe I'd like to just add to the, those two questions. Um, and, it, and I think it groups with the question on Security uh, Council reform. I think there's a broad consensus or recognition that there's not a lot of hope right now for quick advancement on membership reform. Um, but the, uh, the, the critical issues that need to be addressed by reform you, you spoke to, that is that the council currently is not representative of, uh, of current um, the world at present. Um, or not representative enough, um, and there's also recognition that it's 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 not ideally effective. E10 members are contributing 
to make the uh, council more representative and more effective. And you pointed to a number of uh, examples that Cote d'Ivoire um, contributed to during their time in terms of pen holdership and others. And I'm wondering, kind of speaking to uh, our uh, colleague there from, from Ireland, what, what would your advice be to incoming um, E10 members? He asked for what were the limitations. Could you also uh, tell us what would your advice be to E10, to the incoming E10 members to help improve the effectiveness and representativeness of the council? Thank you. With concerning reform, uh, I will start by congratulating Ireland for taking on its seat in the, on the Security Council and at the outset thanking it for its contribution that it will surely make to this branch of the UN. The issue with the reform that I previously discussed is something that has a bearing on the entire world. It's true that the General Assembly no longer talks about this reform, but this debate should be restarted. They should restart the debate on the reform of the Security Council. But this is a pressure cooker. The need for reform is a pressure, per, pressure cooker. It is a pressure cooker. And I call it this way because the permanent uh, members have the, the ball is in on their, in their field. Uh, you know, with a pressure cooker, you need a little steam to let off a little steam. And uh, it's important, the, and the letting them know that it's important for reform discussions to start. Otherwise, the pressure cooker will one day simply blow up. And if it does blow up one day, uh, and uh, and it will, that that's the risk. So the debate around reform will become a necessity, simply speaking, a necessity for everyone. Africa wishes to have five permanent seats. Th we talked about three seats, now five. Five seats, right? Five, five seats in total, including two permanent seats. Some have called for three permanent seats. But the uh, tabulating the number of permanent and non-permanent seats, it would be five. You might agree that uh, this is not something that should be begged for, that today Africa should have the ambition of having permanent seats on the Security Council, regardless of their number, exact number. And it is unjust and even hypocritical to consider the African uh, continent, which is both envied for its natural wealth and natural resources, which is, uh, which is um, uh, the, the, the target of much uh, interest by all the great powers. Uh, this would mean that, why? Because Africa will determine tomorrow's humanity, a continent which has the means through its just th through the sheer force of its resources to determine the future of humanity can, must be present in the Security Council of the United Nations. This debate is going to be imposed to us. It is going to be imposed, and I think that we, it is in everybody's interest to make uh, sure that at the level of the National Assembly, the debate starts again, because at this point, it is not happening at the Security Council. It's not there that we discuss this, but all the members of the Security Council, permanent and non-permanent, are in the Assembly generally. So the, the Cote d'Ivoire with other countries will try to take an initiative in order to relaunch that debate on the reform of the Security Council in the interest of the whole world. Uh, 
that's what I would say concerning the reform of the Security Council. Concerning the Security Council again, to answer Mr. John from Ireland, Cote d'Ivoire uh, has received a lot from the international community in uh, terms of uh, uh, assistance uh, to, in order to come out of the crisis during the crisis and as a post-conflict country. One of the biggest challenges uh, when we arrived at the Council was first to make sure that the image of the Côte d'Ivoire, the perception that the world had of the Côte d'Ivoire changes. And to be present at the Security Council, uh, assume its uh, role and play a political role in the conflict prevention and peacekeeping gives another image of your country than the image that we had while we were in crisis. And to have managed to go from the status of a fragile country to a contributing, to a troop contributing country, uh, to give an image that actually allowed to convince uh, investors that Cote d'Ivoire was a sure country in which they could invest. Uh, because it's investment that creates richness and creates jobs. So that's one, that was an important challenge. Then we said to ourselves, contributing to uh, peacekeeping operations gives uh, expertise to your army. That's something that, uh, that uh, is not always uh, seen. That gives the army expertise that is going to help when they come back to keep uh, peace and stability in the country. So contributing to peacekeeping uh, operations of the UN helps you to, how, uh, how could I say this, uh, uh, concerning uh, materials to, to to, 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 it helps equip your army because you don't become because you don't become a contributor just like that. There's a calendar, there's an agenda, there there's a list of uh, equipment, materials. There's there's a training, a training of your troops. Uh, why 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 is uh, the Senegal have one of the best armies in Africa? It's because it's a country that has often contributed to peacekeeping. Senegal, Ghana, Benin, and Cote d'Ivoire wishes to have, and Nigeria uh, wishes to have a real army, a professional army, uh, to benefit, that will benefit its country. So there are several challenges, uh, but, uh, so I cited two, but you will see that there are several challenges when you become part of the Security Council. And the biggest challenge is to contribute to uh, peace and stability in the world because the African country is, uh, if the world is not at peace, a continent cannot be in peace. So there, there are many challenges. Mr. Lucien Foisy from Côte d'Ivoire, I think that you, uh, talked about the reform, the issue of reform, which I already answered to. Thank you. 15 minutes left, but I feel we've come a bit, a bit full circle back to peacekeeping. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if uh, Jean-Pierre, you would have any uh, thoughts, reflections on what's been discussed. Mm -hmm. Merci. D'abord, uh, je voudrais. Uh, uh, First, I would like to I support what uh, Mr. Minister Fontano says uh, uh, concerning the benefits of uh, participating to uh, peace uh, operations, not only for the army, but in general uh, for uh, national capacities. And uh, through that uh, benefit, the uh, benefit of uh, improving the capacity, experience, and training. There's a, uh, there's a, that, that, so that's a benefit also on peace and security uh, in Africa. Uh, the more the police and armed uh, forces uh, are uh, implicated in that type of uh, operations, they become, they acquire experience and, uh, and, and they become more familiar uh, with um, 
with the fact that uh, an army can be uh, efficient uh, to, to promote uh, peace and security. That's uh, something that, uh, so that's an impact that goes beyond uh, the efficiency of, of our own operations. Uh, secondly, uh, concerning uh, an adjacent theme to reform and that was developed by the minister is that so the role of Africa and peace and security. I see that when we work with the African Union to promote peace, as we've uh, done it uh, for the Central African Republic with uh, joint efforts with the United Nations and the African Union, uh, uh, ended in a peace accord, then uh, the uh, with the Security Council, with the Côte d'Ivoire, and the Peace Commission with the Maroc, and on, with the, under the American presidency. This uh, uh, the junction of uh, efforts of the African Union with the United Nations had uh, an effect that could have not been possible if we had acted alone. So what does that mean? That means that the need of a strong presence of Africa in the Security Council is, uh, is proved by the experience because that's what we observe uh, daily in our action. When we work together, when Africa is united and uh, when, we, when, when we can work in synergy, we're more efficient and the messages are much uh, stronger and, uh, and uh, have a, an impact. Uh, for for the on the beneficiaries, which are the parts of the, the ones of the stakeholders in the conflict, uh, another observation I wish to make is on the role of elected members. I think that uh, first it's very important that uh, uh, they. Uh, they, they know perfectly what the subjects are about, like the Cote d'Ivoire uh, has doing uh, has done, uh, or like for instance with uh, what the Cote d'Ivoire did with Guinea Bissau, uh, the role of the UN in West Africa through uh, UNOWAS and other situations that uh, have been uh, uh, supported by Cote d'Ivoire. So. So uh, there's uh, it's, uh, there's that importance that uh, that elected members are uh, really take on uh, certain subjects, and uh, there's also the couple mechanisms which are emerging and uh, have a role that I think uh, vital for the functioning of the Security Council is the the role of of being a bridge building of building, uh, we have a Security Council that is divided now, uh, unfortunately, and that is characterized by divisions among the permanent members. And I think that uh, the Secretariat of the UN, we expect a lot uh, for uh, the role of, of, uh, P of, uh, of bridge builders. Uh, I, I, we expect this from elected members. and. Uh, also, when on top of it, they have that experience, that uh, legitimacy, like uh, the Cote d'Ivoire, huh? that adds to the capacity of those members, uh, and that can uh, benefit. Uh, we've seen it in many situations that can benefit uh, the Security Council, the UN, that can uh, help overcome difficulties and uh, divisions that characterize our organization today. Uh, excellent uh, uh, remarks to sort of wrap it, uh, uh, this conversation together. Minister, if you have any, any final words to conclude. Goodbye. I wish to thank IPI for having given me the opportunity to share our experience uh, in the Security Council and uh, uh, and, uh, and to talk about what we did during those uh, last two years. I think that uh, which was supported by the president of, of Morocco. Uh, we tried to keep our engagements and to did what we said we would do during the campaign uh, to get that seat. So it's important to 
Yeah, that gives us a, that has given us credibility. I uh, now, now I'm uh, now I think that what Minister Jean Pierre Lacroix said about divisions within the Security Council, I think that that weakens the action of the Council, which uh, often uh, forgets that it's responsible for the security on the planet. The peace tanks are divided between P3 and P2. It's uh, complex. Uh, the 10 other members need to understand that united, they represent a veto. So uh, while we wait for the reform, the 10 non-permanent members, uh, uh, we need to be united, uh, starting with South Africans united in A3, and then we need to unite with the others. That's the reason why we took this initiative uh, of creating that uh, francophone platform of uh, members of the Security Council, which constitutes a consultation platform because we see that uh, several uh, non-permanent countries are francophone. France is the only uh, permanent francophone country, but a certain number are francophone and and mem non-permanent members of the Security Council. So it's an opportunity for francophone countries to, uh, f to reinforce their position uh, on uh, uh, agenda articles. So I wish I thank the audience for having uh, given us the opportunity through their questions to uh, talk about the action of the Ivory Coast in the Security Council. Thank you to all. Uh, for me to just to say really thank you again for sharing uh, your reflections on, uh, on the very productive term of Cote d'Ivoire and the Council, um, your commitment to multilateral institutions uh, in a time when, as we've discussed, many see the Council and other multilateral institutions uh, under challenge, uh, including the divisions discussed, and it's the consistency and credibility of E10 members uh, like Cote d'Ivoire that can help to uh, improve the situation. Uh, to advance legitimacy and the capacity in the council, and I believe uh, you've helped to uh, to show the way forward for all incoming and ten members today. Thank you so much. We hope to have you back at IPI again. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.